Thank you so much. All right, first time I connected this HDMI cable to my laptop, it froze, and then I had to force shutdown. So let's see what happens this time. All right, off to a great start. Cool. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Tori. My pronouns are he, him, uh, and I love maps. And uh, I've got a couple things to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are about here at Niantic. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what's new and then about what's next. Uh, and I really want to keep this like pretty casual, fun, uh, informal, um, not get too heavy into like lots of text, but really focus on like the things that are like really visually stunning. Um, but before that, uh, I'm going to immediately digress. Um, so uh, one of my favorite uh, comedians uh, is Sarah Cooper. I don't know if people know her, but she actually worked in technology for a long time uh, and then switched into becoming a comedian and also an author, and she's hysterically funny. Um, and she, I think, uh, a lot of the things that she has talked about I think will resonate well with a lot of people here. She's experienced life on the East Coast in New York City as well as in San Francisco, and I think she like absolutely like uh, just skewers tech people better than anyone I've, else I've seen on the internet and like in a very elegant way. Um, so she's made a lot of jokes about like what it's like to live in New York and, and San Francisco and like make those comparisons, uh, whether it's like fashion or like what the weather is like. Uh, but she also uh, like what it's like to try to go out and eat. Um, and uh, in particular, why I wanted to start with this uh, is because she also talks about like occupations and what people do for work. Um, so in New York, you know, you've got law, medicine, finance, tech, and then in San Francisco, you've got tech law, tech medicine, tech finance, and tech tech. Um, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about tech tech. Um, so with that, uh, let's dive in and talk a little bit about what we are about uh, at Niantic. So our mission is to inspire people to explore the world together. Uh, and to date, that has been over 175 countries, over 25 billion miles walked, and over 400 million friends made. And what really ties a lot of this together and what makes me feel super lucky to get to work on this at Niantic is the map. And we talk a lot about this notion of like a flywheel. Um, and I'll be talking about this a little bit today, but there's really this awesome virtuous cycle that, that exists in a lot of different places. Um, I think one, one that I think about a lot is uh, anytime you want to go from like Long Beach back to LAX or like from like New York to Brooklyn or anything like that or from Manhattan to Brooklyn, uh, you are able to see how long it's going to take you to get from point A to point B because there are hundreds of thousands if not millions of people participating in that ecosystem that are sending like a GPS ping from their pocket up to the cloud that is then telling you roughly how many people are moving and how they're moving between you and where you want to go. Uh, so that gives a useful piece of information to you, but only if there are a lot of other people in the ecosystem that are like sort of signed into that. Uh, whether or not they're like implicit or explicitly consenting to like Apple and Google, I'm not going to get into that. Um, but it is like super helpful to have a whole bunch of people participating in the ecosystem when you get little bits of information back out of the ecosystem. And we are definitely like in the very early stages of like spatial computing, but there is this really important cycle that's finally starting to take off between adding spatial information into this new map and then being able to participate in a visually stunning recreation of a scene or like experience AR content. So this virtuous cycle of like having all these scans that then build maps that we're able to build these really large cool experiences uh, and engage with our developer community to do that. And then that actually draws a lot of more engagement in and then participation in that ecosystem starts to give us the basis of this flywheel and solving this cold start problem, I think is gonna be an absolutely necessary step. And obviously a lot of people here are taking an enormous uh, role in making that possible. Um, one thing I want to champion that I'm very proud of, um, last year, uh, almost exactly a year ago, we launched uh, VPS and Ingress. Uh, this is one of our oldest games. Uh, Brian McClendon referenced Ingress this morning in his talk. Uh, it's very near and dear to me as well because they have served in a lot of ways as sort of like the uh, tip of the spear in experimenting with a lot of these new technologies. So scanning has been around in Ingress for a very long time, but they have now introduced VPS into the game as well. Um, if anyone here has played Ingress, uh, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the issues that GPS spoofing has caused with the game. And VPS actually allows a way to prove uh, in a very difficult to spoof, if not impossible to difficult, difficulty, uh, difficulty to spoof way that you actually were at that location and you're not just spoofing with your device. 
Um, so since we launched last summer, we've had millions and millions of instances of players using this to prove that they went to a location and they get that nice incentive in the game. But this is one example of sort of completing that loop between contributing to the ecosystem and then getting something back out of it. And uh, this is something we're excited to see more and more of going forward. Uh, now back to tech tech. Um, we've talked a lot about Gaussian splats, uh, but we haven't done a really good job of defining it. Um, so last night I just Googled it. Uh, what is a Gaussian splat? Um, so conceptually the Gaussian splat is considered a spherically symmetric 3D reconstruction kernel centered on a voxel. Um, I've been working on computer vision for 11 years and I was more confused <laughs> after reading that. Uh, so I was like, hold on, I'll go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia says, Gaussian splatting is a volume rendering technique that deals with the direct rendering of volume data without converting the data into surface or line primitives. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm really struggling here. So um, for the purposes of today's conversation, let's just say a Gaussian splat is like a six dimensional photograph. Um, and I'll show some like examples of this that I think will make it a little clearer. Um, but I think that's a really cool way to think about it because it's like a really visually stunning uh, reconstruction of a scene that I think makes a lot of the work that we're doing that's kind of invisible much more tangible uh, for other people that don't work in AR, like my parents and grandparents. Um, so uh, now I'm gonna dive into some architecture um, and sort of talk about how, how these different pieces fit together. So everything starts with a scan. Uh, if anyone has used any of our games or you've used uh, Scanniverse or you've used like our Wayfair app, uh, everything starts with being able to capture spatial information. Um, so you can basically think of a scan as a series of posed image frames. And that's sort of illustrated over here on the right side. But what's happening is you're collecting spatial information along with, um, along with each frame of imagery. And that allows us to reconstruct the different artifacts that we use to build the visible map and the invisible map. So what we're actually showcasing uh, recently, including at our, our booth nearby, is we can now do this on the client, which is super cool. Uh, a lot of this technology historically has required an enormous amount of horsepower up in the cloud, and you have to wait a couple hours to get something back. But we're, out, we're now actually able to build all these assets on your device and give you that immediate feedback, uh, which is super helpful, both to make sure you're doing a good job, but also give you like faster, um, a faster like dopamine hit of like, wow, that was really cool that I was able to do this. Um, there's three basic types of artifacts that we build with scans. Uh, first, uh, sorry, this is like a super ambiguous term. It gets thrown all over the place. When we say map, we're talking about the invisible map that is the artifact that is used to localize you. So you send an image from your device up to the cloud, and then we compare that to a map that then returns your six degree of freedom pose relative to whatever you're looking at. So every time you localize, we're just telling you exactly where you are relative to what you're looking at. So if you've constructed a scene in augmented reality, that keeps you moving around. And then there's also tracking on your device, however you're doing that, that sort of keeps you up to speed in between localization re responses that you get from the cloud. Um, we're now also able to build these on device. Uh, that's gonna be something we can share later on. Uh, the other two things are a little easier to understand, actually, because they're visible and really tangible for us and for machines. So meshes are pretty pretty familiar concept. Meshes are super useful for understanding, they're useful for authoring, they're useful for physics. Uh, so when you pull in a mesh, you're able to have things like uh, occlusions and colliders uh, that make it really cool to build or easier to build um, immersive experiences. And then splats, as we said, are just like six dimensional photographs that are like super immersive and can also be experienced in things like headsets and really make you feel like you are standing there in every single space you are, every single possible orientation of your face is gonna be a little bit different just like the real world. The other thing that happens uh, when you do a scan usually is you also upload that scan. So that's like kind of the other part of the equation. Um, thank you for uploading your scans. We really appreciate it. Uh, so when you do that, um, it's really helpful for us uh, and for you eventually because we're able to combine together different scans from different times, different places, different lighting conditions, weather conditions, people, devices, uh, et cetera. And building all of that together allows us to build assets in terms of meshes, sorry, that's, that should be maps, uh, in terms of maps, meshes, and splats that are a lot more durable to the environmental variation of whatever location you are in. Um, thanks for indulging me. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's new. So uh, as I mentioned, we have a booth nearby where you can check out uh, Scanniverse. I think this is something that you really have to see and experience to believe, and the fact that you can now go through the full cycle of like, 
installing the software, doing a scan, seeing the splat, and being able to share it in about a minute and a half is like really neat. Um, and again, this is available on both iOS and Android. We're continuing to make more and more improvements on how quickly these splats can be generated. Uh, but we're really excited that this is something that is totally free uh, and can make a huge impact. And I think also, again, makes this a lot more tangible. In terms of like VPS specifically, we also have a bunch of new improvements uh, for, that are already available to developers. Uh, so we, as uh, Brian mentioned this morning, we now have over a quarter of a million public, high quality VPS activated locations around the world. Um, really, this is a reflection of where there are the most people engaging with AR today. So certainly places like Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Tokyo, London, Amsterdam, all have many, many of these uh, locations available. And importantly, any developer anywhere can add any location uh, and we will activate it for you for free, right now at least. Um, We've also managed to increase the average localizable area. So what that just means is like, as you can see over here on the right, the sizes of these meshes are getting larger and larger. And this mesh is like a good approximation for the size of the play area in which you can create your AR canvas. Uh, one other really exciting thing is we have increased the maximum localization distance from five to 50 meters, uh, which actually means you can start to build experiences that are very large uh, in size and like see things like from across the street or even from across like a small park. Um, and I'll show an example of that in a little bit. Uh, we also have better quality meshes and alignment as I'm showing over here on the right. Uh, and pretty much everything I'm gonna be talking about today will also have implications for HMDs, which is really exciting. Just a real quick word, um, also a little more sort of how this architecture works. Um, so on the client, we're able to generate meshes for you. We can also pull out semantic information. And now with Scanniverse, you can get your splats on device. Uh, and then as I mentioned, once these are uploaded to the server and we start to collect scans from different people, devices, times, et cetera, we can actually fuse these together and align this with other types of world data and importantly, uh, have these in a way that they're geo-referenced. Uh, because typically, when you're in an AR experience, all that really matters to you where you are is how you are oriented relative to the scene. Uh, but as we start to make larger and larger maps and connect everything together, uh, developers are actually going to want to be able to do things like drop in AR content based on a latitude, a longitude, and an elevation, as opposed to just um, an X, Y, and a Z in relative sense. So now uh, I want to talk a little bit about what's next. And my favorite part about this is this is like near future. This is not like 2027. This is like later this year um, and beyond. So. Um, I, re I referenced earlier that we're now able to localize from like 50 plus meters away. Uh, this is a, an experience where we built like fully end to end. So we actually did all of our own scanning. Uh, we used our own tools to build an experience. Uh, and this was an, an incredible um, sort of demo that was built by our UX engineering team at Niantic, uh, working with designers uh, as well as engineers, like sort of partnering together to make this possible. Uh, so we built sort of this immersive, uh, uh, sort of walking guide as you're arriving to the ferry building in San Francisco. Um, so this like shows like the ferry schedule. Um, and then as you're walking, uh, we sort of show and illuminate a path for the person to walk all the way up to the building. And what's cool here is you maintain localization, you're able to track uh, and the experience continues to work. Um, zero engineers were harmed in the production of this video so far. Um, I honestly don't recommend trying to build immersive experiences that require crossing train tracks in a street. Um, but it does prove that localization worked well enough to keep us alive. Um, it was quite immersive. Um, so now we emerge on the other side. Uh, you can see we are still localized and then we can like have other animations like come in and play as we walk all the way up to the door. Uh, so this again has implications for how we scan, how we build the maps and how we localize. Uh, but these are all things that we're gonna be able to avail to developers soon. Uh, this also means um, one other great part of this is we're able to build one map one time, and that map can be used for both web and Unity-based VPS experiences. Uh, the other thing, as we start to build larger and larger maps, is we also are looking into supporting new data modalities, which is just a fancy word for types. Uh, so there is no requirement still to use LiDAR uh, to build maps or use VPS. Uh, but we are able to use LiDAR uh, to enhance our maps and make them even bigger and even more powerful. Um, so this is an example that we put together with our research team uh, where we actually took a giant LiDAR, uh, LiDAR data set, superimposed it, used the same localization system. So no LiDAR was used uh, to do the localization on the right. And as the person's walking around, we're just sort of overlaying this larger world model that we created. Um, and as you can see, the person walking is just like so excited they can't hold their camera still. Um, 
but uh, very exciting for me too, I also want to be able to. Uh, finally, um, this is like one of my favorite videos. I think this really sort of illustrates the, the, the notion of like what is a six dimensional photograph. Uh, it really is like every single place you go, um, you are able to see like a completely unique representation that feels very, very real. Um, so this is actually a combination of a whole bunch of different data types that we're able to all fuse together and georeference uh, in London. And you can see we can even zoom all the way down and like go around this building and into the building and like have one continuous experience. Uh, so you can imagine how uh, if you wanted to build a game where you're like bird simulator or something like this could be like a really cool experience in a headset. Um, so as I mentioned, like this is something that is again, like this is coming not 2027. This is coming like very soon. Uh, and it's a really powerful technique. Um, in this particular example, it's pulling in data. Um, that actually requires a lot of work on the server to make this possible, but the, the, pay, the payoff you get for that is like enormous uh, to be able to build experiences like this. Uh, one more thing, uh, which is not going to be a surprise, but um, we have Scanniverse, uh, we have our geospatial browser uh, for building real world experiences. Uh, if you put those together, this is not profound. Uh, we do have Scanniverse for developers available today, uh, which is super exciting. Um, Scanniverse, in my opinion, is the most powerful scanning app on the planet. Uh, and starting today, we have now connected that into Niantic Map ecosystem. So any VPS developer building on 8th Wall is now going to be able to create your scans directly in Scanniverse. And I'm just going to spend like a few minutes talking about how that works, and then I'll try to leave a minute or two for questions. So to get started, um, this is all available live on 8thWall.com uh, slash geospatial browser today. Um, you actually just generate a QR code that will automatically pull your credentials into Scanniverse and link your, your Scanniverse app up, and then you only need to do that once. Once you've done that, you'll be able to use the entire geospatial browser interface inside of a web view in the Scanniverse app. Um, so you no longer will need to use the Wayfair app and then go back and forth between that and Scanniverse. Everything is just in one app, and then obviously this interface is, will stay completely synced and consistent with the desktop experience. Um, you're also, we also added a bunch of filters so you can sort of control uh, what shows up in the map and how you inter interact with that. As well as being able to, uh, just like you can in the desktop interface, you can browse locations, see additional details, uh, and you can also more easily add locations to the map by just hitting the plus button. Um, use that same method for creating test scans. And then finally, whenever you want to take a scan, um, if you see over here on the left, uh, whenever you select a location, as long as you're close enough to do a scan, there's an option to add scans to it. When you press that Add Scans button, it just opens up the native Scanniverse interface. And this is a much more performant, faster, easier to use interface than what's currently available in the Wayfair app. Um, so to summarize, uh, Scanniverse for Developers is available today. You're able to do your entire VPS workflow now inside of Scanniverse. We have our iOS beta available now. Uh, support for Android as well as Lightship side is coming soon. Uh, so by soon, I mean like later this summer. Um, and you can download this. Uh, obviously, Scanniverse is free to download. You can get started right away. Uh, importantly, if you have Scanniverse on your device and you've already created a whole bunch of uh, scans and splats and everything, and then you connect your Apple account, nothing happens to your scans. They will all stay intact, so you don't have to worry about anything happening there. You can also unlink your account anytime you need to, just in case there's any concerns about that. Um, yeah, I think that's actually all I wanted to talk about. I'm happy to take a few minutes of questions. We have about four minutes for questions. We have a microphone up here if you want to come up, but I see a couple of hands raised, so I shall come to you. Thank you. Uh, so one of the, my concerns as a developer is, is costs, and I was wondering if you could talk about um, at scale for maybe 10,000 users, what sort of cost we would be incurring uh, for that localization? That is a great question. So uh, as folks here that have used our VPS are probably familiar, currently uh, we are not charging for VPS because uh, we're very, very early. Uh, I unfortunately cannot commit to what the cost is going to be on stage right now, but I can tell you we are going to have an update uh, also, not in 2027, very, very soon in terms of what price is going to look like, because we understand we have a commitment to our developers that if they want to build an, an, app, an application that's going to have 10,000 or 100,000, et cetera, users, you need to understand like, how those unit economics are going to work out with how you would utilize the VPS service. 
Um, so I can confidently say we will have an update coming later this year about like what our pricing is gonna look like in the longer term, specifically for self-serve, but we will also be able to like work closely with partners if there are special use cases and like customizations that need to be made on top of that. Great. Any other questions? Please do step up to the microphone. I'm realizing what a large room it is, and it's going to be really hard for me to run around here. Is this one? Okay, good. It's working. Uh, quick question on, like, trying to make it as simple as possible, but still a legal question, kind of. Uh, things like MP3s back in the day, they only became a problem because we were dubbing tapes and nobody knew, and then they were digital and MP3 and everybody did know. Uh, with a great Gaussian splat of, say, Stonehenge, if it's in the next 18 games straight, do we anticipate any sort of weird, like, legal challenges, obstacles to adoption, things like that coming up in the future as far as the antic is aware? Ooh, I think, uh, I think we're gonna keep lawyers very well employed over the next decade uh, as we explore this exciting new frontier. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. I think like one of the biggest challenges we have obviously is like data privacy and making people feel comfortable with like sharing their creations with the world. Um, fortunately, we have a very long uh, pedigree at Niantic of protecting the data of people that upload uh, and share their scans with the map. So we do like things like anonymization and um, like, so we scrub like faces and license plates the same way you do on like Google Street View. Uh, and we're also like very careful about like keeping all that data secure. Um, moderation is gonna be a really important part of our strategy as more and more of the sharing happens. In terms of legal concerns, we also have the precedent of like working with businesses if like they don't want a Pokestop at their restaurant, for example. Um, so those are some things that we do have experience with, uh, but I, I do think um, six dimensional photos also means six dimensional legal implications. So um, <laughs> more to come. Thank you. We have time for another question. Looks like we have a contender. My question is a little different. Uh, I'm a set designer and I use, your, I use this kind of technology. Uh, let's say I need a fountain in Brussels that I need to recreate. Um, is there a way for me to isolate that and maybe get dimensions or a way to output it to something else? Yes, Okay. Uh, definitely recommend stopping by and chatting with some more folks from the scanning team who work on Scanniverse, but I do believe we already have tools for specifically measuring dimensions of the outputs from Scanniverse, which are not only splats, but also much more things like meshes that are easier to measure. Yeah, this is like a dream come true for me. <laughs> Happy to hear it. All right, we have 16 more seconds. Um, Can we quick. save specific positions for LBE experiences to make them more uh, efficient? Say, sorry, can you repeat that? So if we want to make an LBE experience for a specific location, are we able to cache or offload those to make it more efficient for our users? Potentially. Let's talk right after this. Okay, great. Perfect timing, Tori. I am impressed. <laughs> if you have any other questions, please do see Tori outside. I know there must be a Niantic booth in the expo hall. Plenty of people from Niantic here to answer your questions. Another round of applause, please, for our speaker.